this morning as we begin a brand new book, the book of Malachi in the Old Testament. What we're going to see in the book of Malachi is how God forges his faithful followers. We think of a, a forge or a blacksmith that takes something that was hard and immovable and he heats it up and under the pressure of the crucible of the furnace he's able to mend and bend and mold that into something useful well we too in our hardness of heart god has to sometimes apply pressure and heat and force to mend and bend us into something that's beautiful and for his service malachi talks about that this morning though we're just going to look at malachi chapter 1 verses 1 through 5 let's go ahead and Read our passage this morning. It says this, The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I love Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of hosts says, you may build, but I will tear them down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel. So we come to this man, Malachi, and Malachi may be his proper name or it may be a title for Malachi just means messenger, the messenger of God to the people of Israel, this prophet. It's the last book listed in the Old Testament, but it isn't necessarily the last book of the New Testament era. This was, takes place after the exile is over and the people of Israel are coming back from Babylon into their own land again. And just as we saw in Judges that we went through uh, earlier in the year, now that the crisis is over, they're out of Babylon, they're back home, the people become complacent and slip into sin. Unlike some of the prophets in the Old Testament that speak in signs and visions, Malachi is actually pretty straightforward. He speaks plainly to them. It almost reads like a New Testament epistle of just laying out, here's what God says and this is what you must do. One commentator says this, it says, they could see, Israel, nothing wrong with the way they were living or with the way they approached God and worship. When challenged about their attitudes, there was no acknowledgement of wrongdoing on their part. Instead, they were prepared to defend their behavior. Indeed, they more than hinted that, they had gone, that what had gone wrong was that the Lord did not live up to his side of the covenant. It was a time of religious cynicism. So they looked at their atrocities, they looked at the surrounding nations rising up against Israel, and they accused God of not living up to his part, not looking at themselves at all as having any issue. It's one of the reasons why uh, in every week we have a time of corporate confession, realizing that we as Christians are always in a state of repentance, are always in a state of uh, assessing ourselves before God and seeking his forgiveness and his mercy. That goes back to Martin Luther, the very first uh, uh, line of the 95 Thesis was that the state of a Christian was to be continually one of repentance. Well, Israel had lost their way, and instead of looking at themselves as an error, they looked at God that he was an error. We can fall into that same thing sometimes. God, why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this to happen? Somehow we think there was a promise that God gave us that he's now failing at providing what they fill into wasn't just a hostility, but more dangerous than a hostility towards God is an apathy towards God. One where God is kind of irrelevant in the minds and their thinking. It means they don't understand God's love. They thought God didn't love them, so they lived how they wanted to. What does it matter to sacrifice, to worship the right way that God commanded, or go to church, or do these things? Love itself forces change. And that's what they forgot, the overwhelming, powerful love of God. It drew them into a sense that lulled them into a sleepless state. Love forces change, not stagnation. You think, oh, you might preach about love too much. Well, love changes things. Love moves, motivates. Just like a boy who may have a, 
a friend who is a girl and they're, they know each other for years and years, once that boy confesses his love, that relationship changes one way or another, even for acceptance or rejection. Something is going to change once love is declared. And God here is declaring his love to his people. Verse 1, it says, the oracle of the word of the Lord. Now, the, go ahead and go to that, that first slide. What we're seeing here is that God forges the faithful through the love of election. Sometimes we think of election as in God chose us before the foundation of the world in eternity past, the, the uh, covenant of redemption between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, choosing to glorify themselves by the salvation of people and choosing those individuals who he wanted to draw to himself for the salvation of sinners. Sometimes we look at that doctrine and think it's just some kind of academic thing. It's some kind of really cool uh, insight into how God works and how salvation works. But what we need to realize is that very act is the supreme act of love. God uses election. He uses predestination to draw his people and call his people and choose his people because he loves his people. Because he cares about them. He loved them before they even existed. He loved us before we were people. Before I had atoms and molecules. Before my parents did, or my grandparents did, or my great-grandparents did. Going all the way back before Adam even existed. He knew me. He knew you, beloved Christian. And he chose you because he loved you. Not because he foresaw what, foresaw what you were going to be and what you were going to do and how you were going to love him and choose him and the works you were going to do, but just because he loved you. You say, how could that be? Well, we do it all the time. I loved each and every one of my children before they were born. They didn't do anything for me. In fact, even after they were born, I, I gave more than they gave, right? I had to do more for them, especially my wife had to do more for them. Um, they didn't have works that they published when they were in the womb. They didn't have any special ability. They weren't jugglers or, you know, uh, trapeze artists. They didn't, they didn't do anything because they were simply babies before even born. And yet I loved them. Why? Because they're mine. They didn't have to do anything. See, the highest form of love isn't what someone does in performance. We love them simply because we do. The doctrine of election, of God predestined you to be adoption as sons, is because he simply loved you, because you were his. So the oracle of the word of the Lord comes to them. This Hebrew word for oracle carries the connotation of a burden. Sometimes we think of oracle as message. This is oracle as in burden. The King James actually translates it that way. The message is one that is a weight and a dread for Malachi to have to give. It's not a word of giving whimsical advice. It's the type of word that would, you would give as an intervention into someone's life that's going the wrong way. Malachi is coming to Israel saying, you're going off the rails. Come back to the Lord God. So in verse 2, what's this burdensome message that Malachi has to give? I have loved you, says the Lord. What a strange thing to say was burdensome. Sounds like a good message. Why such a message was burdensome is shown by their response. But you say, how have you loved us? Throughout the book, there are objections raised. And these aren't just rhetorical devices. But the actual sentiment of the people of Israel at the time. Malachi uses them to tear down their arguments and show that they have bad excuses for their apathy. Here the people counter the good word that the Lord loves them with complete disbelief. They question his love and his goodness. They call his truthfulness into question. Their cynicism has so eaten away at their souls that they question even God's simple statements. The Lord God loves us, his people, those that have accepted him as his Lord and Savior. He loved us so much that on the cross he died for our sins. Jesus died for our sins, took our sins, and rose again three days later. And yet sometimes we can be guilty of saying, does God really love me? 
That's not pious, by the way. Sometimes we think of some kind of self-deprecating way that, well, we, we can just view ourselves as worms, we can view ourselves as pathetic and useless, and that somehow makes us holy or right in the eyes of God. It is never pleasing for God for him to say something and you say, do you really mean that? Imagine your own child coming to you and you, you telling your kid, I love you. And them saying, no, you don't. Not really. Does that endear them to their affections? No, that, that causes you distress. And this is what the people of God did to God himself. When he declares his love, they say, how have you loved us? No, you don't. We must believe God in what he says. When he says he loves us, we accept it as truth. We accept that love, not reject it and push it away. Sometimes their objection here, how have you loved us, is not Esau's Jacob's brother, meaning is not the surrounding nations against Israel overcoming Israel. They're using Jacob and Esau, those, uh, uh, that story from Genesis about the two brothers, um, as a metaphor for their own nas- nations. So Jacob being the nation of Israel, which descended from him, and Esau being the surrounding nations that are around him. So their complaint is, how have you loved us if the surrounding nations are ruling over us? We can hear this often today with questions such as, well, after a disaster, where was God? Where was he when this happened? Where was he when my father died? Where was he when this tornado came through? Where was he in the the sadness and in the misery and in the suffering of this world. Jeremiah 31.3 gives us the answer. The Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I continued my faithfulness to you. The answer is he's always there. Right there in the pain, in the suffering, in the turmoil, in the disaster. God is right there with his people. He has promised to never leave us and never forsake us. In fact, the thing about God is he enters into our suffering through Jesus Christ. And in the New Testament, it even says that we share in Christ's suffering. So not only does he share in our suffering, we share in his. God loves us with a love that also is a continued, faithful, everlasting love. He never breaks his covenant of love to us. It never goes away. It's never, oh, you've sinned one too many times. I'm sick of you, therefore I withdraw my love for you. His love continues on and on and never ends. Sometimes, though, we have a view of God like a father who can never be pleased. And oftentimes we take the idea of our father and superimpose it onto God as if God was like our earthly dads. Or we have this idea of God like a boss that can never be made happy. You ever worked under a tyrannical boss that everything was always more, 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 and you never do enough? And sometimes we think God is that way too. Always demanding more of us, always demanding more good works, always demanding more money, always demanding more service, always demanding more from us in order to get his love and compassion. But that's not how God is. That's how the people of Israel viewed God. But that's not his character. How does God explain his love to them? Once again, by bringing up election. Look, you don't have, it's not more, more, more. I chose you and I loved you before you had anything. You didn't even have some, let alone more. You had nothing. And I chose you and I loved you then. So I love you now. When we look at the doctrines of grace, that of those things that are basis for Reformed theology. The primary impetus behind it all is God's love for us. God is not being the equivalent of a mere internet Calvinist where every topic has to be about election. Rather, he is showing that the love he has for them is manifest in his choosing them and opposing those who are against them. And notice here, it says, Esau I love, and, or Jacob I loved, and Esau I hated. It's not just love less. It's not Jacob I loved, and Esau I loved less. It's Esau I hated. I rejected Esau. I oppose those that are against God's people. 
It's not just that God is active in choosing and then passive towards others. No, he will actively tear down the plans and devices of those who are against his people. As the psalmist says, he will one day make his enemies his footstool. This act of love, it's required of him that because he loves his people, he opposes those that are against his people. It's, it's, it's not this neutral thing, just as if it's not a, a harsh thing or a mean thing that God opposes them. Just as it is not harsh or mean if a, a thief or a burglar would come in the middle of the night and break into my home. If I was to defend my family, I am doing that out of love for my family, not necessarily mere hatred or variance against the intruder. So too, God stands opposed to all those that are against you, God's people. You can see that election is not just some cold doctrine. It's how God shows his love to you. It's the basis and foundation and beginning of when he loved you and carries on into the future. And that's why he brings it up to them. Look, Israel, you're asking how I loved you. I'll tell you how. I chose you. Before you did anything, I loved you. Now, notice this is on the national scale. So here's a, a little uh, slight rabbit trail, all right? This passage here in Malachi, because it's repeated over in Romans 9, this passage in Malachi is not about individual election. Romans 9 is. This, while Jacob and Esau, the issue of election is being brought up, here it is in the sense of nations. Jacob and Esau are being used as metaphors for Israel and the surrounding nations around them. Romans 9 deals salvifically of election of people to salvation, and here it's God's people covenantally. The reason I bring that up is because we must be careful that we don't use the Bible to show the right doctrine from the wrong text. Sometimes there are things that are good, solid truth of the Bible, but we need to make sure that we're using the Bible responsibly so that we show the right passage, the right book of the Bible, with the right doctrine that we're teaching. We see here that he is using them as an illustration of Jacob and Esau. But, so, God uses and shows his love through election. That's how he forges you. This forge continues on into your sanctification. He's continuing to mold you and shape you. Point number two. God forges the election of the faithful through the protection of his people. Go ahead and next slide. And we hinted at that, actually. Verse three through four. The mark of God's people... Are, who are the, the mark of, of a people who are not God's people is that they trust in themselves. So God's people trust in God, not God's people trust in them. They trust in their ability and what they can do. They have a confident pride in themselves that they can make it happen. They can do it on their own. Yet God will tear down everything they arrogantly accomplish. He says this, that Edom, the surrounding nations, say that we'll rebuild the shattered ruins, and God himself says, you know what, I'm just going to tear it down again. He is the Lord of hosts. That term is the Lord of the armies of heaven. We'll tear it down. They will not be righteous, but they, unfortunately, are a wicked country surrounding them. And they will not be a people for God's mercy, but a people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Now, how do we understand this? Of God choosing his people and not choosing these other people that are against his people and opposing them. McKay, one commentator, says this, Faith is not the meriting cause of election, but Edom's sin is the meriting cause of their punishment. What that means is, while God doesn't look down the corridors of time and chose you because he, you chose him, faith isn't the cause of why you're elect. You're elect, you have faith because you were elect. However, Edom, those surrounding nations that aren't God's people, their meriting cause of punishment is their sin. So our faith is not caused by us, it's caused by God choosing us. And yet, their punishment isn't directly caused by God, but their sin itself that God is holding them accountable to. We have received mercy. They have received justice. No one has received something that was unfair or unjust. Everyone receives what they have been predestined to get, one for mercy, vessels of mercy, and others for vessels of wrath, both giving glory to God, both completely just, both completely righteous, for God cannot do sin, but is always righteous. 
Psalm 89 says this, I will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod of their iniquity and the stripes. So this is what he's saying. I'm going to punish these, the people of God who aren't following my ways, verse 33. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. So even when the people of God were saying to God, how do you think you love us? You don't really love us. Apathetic to him, not caring about him, while he was putting them in um, uh, uh, um, discipline, putting them through forging, still he says, I will not remove my steadfast love. That never goes away. You may find yourself in what feels like a forge this morning. The pressures of this world, the pressures of this life, the pressures of bills and society and family and diagnoses and everything else just comes and, and squeezes you in. God's love is not far from you. God has not removed his steadfast, faithful love from you. It may seem terrible. And maybe it is terrible because there are bad things that happen in this life. But God has not removed his steadfast, faithful, covenantal love from you, which will never go away. Now, even though this passage may not be about individual election like Romans 9 does, it doesn't mean it doesn't relate to us. You see, we are not just saved individualistically. I am not just saved by myself unto myself. I am not a church unto myself. We are saved into a body. We are saved into a people. We are saved into each other. The chosen nation today wasn't the Holy Roman Empire, nor the United Kingdom, nor even America. And it's not the modern parliamentary republic that calls itself Israel. It's the people of God in the church. First Peter talks about this, that now you are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people for his own possession the church is literally the called out ones, the assembly. You yourself and I by myself am not a church. That's an impossibility by the very word itself. Your family alone, while maybe composed of believers, is not in itself a church, but must be called out together. And the gathering together is actually what makes us, by definition, a church. It's fundamental to what the church even is. You see, I am not the church but we are gathered together. We are God's people whom his everlasting love rests upon, who his covenantal faithfulness never shies away from. The church, as you see, is adopted into the lineage of Abraham. Election, then, isn't just individualistic and autonomous. Election is into a family. Just as my family, my children, didn't choose to be part of the Ayala family, so too, we didn't choose to be part of the family of God. He instead elected us. It's not just that God is your father, but you are adopted into a heritage with brothers and sisters who have God also as their father. As we mentioned in Romans 2.9, he made us a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a people for his own possession. Why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We are saved as the people of God, connected to one another into this congregation. The Bible, Old and New Testament, know nothing of disconnected, autonomous, lone wolf people of God. God forges the faithful into a nation of believers. We're in this together. So this means that God's covenantal faithfulness will never leave us, and we who have accepted that need to show God's covenantal faithfulness to each other. We need to love each other. That not only has, is God, will he never leave us and never forsake us. Church, we need to never leave and forsake each other. We need to pursue each other. That even when some of us may be in sin, we may be in rebellion, we may be wandering astray, but we chase after each other. We show God's love that we have received in our brothers and sisters in Christ. The church you see as a nation is an embassy. We stand 
outside of all the governmental strictures and structures of this world, while we're citizens of America, we are citizens also of another country. And so when we gather here, we're gathering as kingdom citizens primarily and only as Americans secondarily. We trust that God is reconciling the entire world to himself, not counting in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God, making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We then are ambassadors, gathered together as an embassy, a foothold in a foreign land, an enemy territory. Here we stand to go out of these four walls to bring forth this message of reconciliation. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. God forges the faithful through the protection of his people, and part of that protection is us together, showing that love and mercy and compassion to each other. Last point, verse number five. God forges the faithful through the spreading of his glory. Notice this, verse number five. But your eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel. Now, to understand this, we have to realize how geographically contained the theology of ancient Israel was. In fact, some of the ancient rabbis even wondered if, if a... If a, a good Orthodox Jewish person died outside the borders of Israel and wasn't born in Israeli sand, will he still go to heaven? They are so tied to God is here and here alone and not anywhere else. And now, through Malachi, God is saying God is great and his glory will be seen beyond merely the borders of Israel. It's going to expand larger than you have. You have in your mindset merely this, this geographical boundary of this is the promised land of God. God here is say, saying all of the earth, every land, every border is my promised land. I promise to you not just a sliver of territory in the Middle East, but a new heaven and a new earth itself. The reason they didn't see God's love is they were too focused merely on their own local problems, which were caused, by the way, by their own sin. And that's why we often miss God's love for us. We're so focused in minute details on our issues and our problems that we can't step outside of ourselves and our, the, the things that are plaguing us to look at the glory of God, the greatness of God, who's so much bigger than the things that we're dealing with. And that doesn't mean that we ignore the problems that we have in our life, but it does mean we put those problems in proper perspective, that they are small and God is big. Rather, they should have seen with their eyes outward at the great work that God was doing in the preservation of his elect nation and the destruction of the reprobate nations around them. The Lord is great, not just in their land and neighborhood, but beyond their borders into the whole earth. Psalm 104 says this, O Lord... How manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. All the creatures of the earth belong to God. They're his. They're his possession. Psalm 72, 19. Blessed be the glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen, it says. The entire earth filled with the glory of God. We, in fact, are testaments to this in a small, minor way. This very morning, as we gather together, far outside the borders of Israel, Plant City is 6,600 miles away from Jerusalem. We are testaments that God's glory reaches far beyond that sliver of land into the whole earth as Christians all around the world this morning that we join with are singing praises and praying and hearing the word of God preached. We cover this globe and this planet, declaring the glory of God as little embassies in all the various nations of the world that Christians gather in. As people of a new nation, ambassadors, we are to filter into every area of life 
And within the sphere of influence to be ambassadors, telling of another kingdom and the message of gospel reconciliation. You see, ask, how, is, how will God spread his glory to the ends of the earth? <laughs> That's where you come in. God uses you to spread his message of reconciliation so that his glory goes all throughout the planet. And how does he do that? Well, he's placed you with spheres of influence. He's placed you in jobs. He's placed you in communities. He's placed you in churches. He's placed you in, uh, in our context, he's placed us in America with the ability to vote. He's placed us in the uh, surrounding neighborhoods that we're in. He's placed us with our ability of, of uh, where we shop and go grocery shopping and uh, the places that we visit and the restaurants that we're in. All the while, we never have a retirement from being ambassadors of the kingdom of God. You may object to how much change you can bring. How much can I really change in this world? How much glory to God can I really bring? Because you're not a multi-millionaire CEO. You're not a tech mogul. You're not a politician or a renowned celebrity. You may say, well, you know, I'm just, maybe I'm a plumber or a computer programmer or a chaplain in one hospital or, or, or a, 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 you know, an accountant. I can't affect much change. You may think I'm just a well driller or an air conditioned man or I'm a housewife or a construction worker. You know what God used to first spread the gospel and to lead to the evangelization of the entire Roman Empire? Fishermen. Not CEO millionaires, not tech moguls, not celebrities. People that made their living catching fish on the Galilean countryside. This is the point. You wonder, where's my ministry? Where am I going to be effective? Wherever God has you, there is your ministry. We don't need to go look outside to big plans and big dreams and change in the world. God has placed you right exactly where he wants you to be an ambassador that spreads the gospel message to his glory. The job that you have, the family that you have, the neighborhood that you're in, you're not there by accident. Use that, leverage that influence that you have in this world seated throughout all of our country and think how many Christians touch so many around them we're everywhere we're all over the place we should use that for God's glory and the love of our neighbor be an ambassador where you are and spread the glory of God but lest this gets too much on track we need to remember the primary application isn't necessarily about you spreading God's glory, but that he will spread his own glory. He will do this. He will make it happen. You see, because he loves you, he is forging you. He is molding you. You have the privilege to be the very means that he uses to spread his glory. So in closing, when God says he loves you, beloved, and he does, don't question him. When things don't go your way or finances, health, or whatever they may be, those stressors of life that come, don't, when things don't work the way you want them to, don't question God's love. Rather, question your response to God's love. How am I to understand God's love? Are you being motivated like the Edomites to build something for yourself? Something bad happened, so i got to make all these things happen? Or, are you motivated by courage, knowing that God loves you, and that he'll take care of you, just as he took care of sparrows, and he took care of the lilies of the field. And lilies of the field, they don't do anything. They don't toil, they don't spin, they just look pretty. And, and then they wither, and they're thrown into the oven. But God takes care of them, he feeds them, and God will take care of you. He'll feed you and take care of you. Many of the great ills that we have as Christians is because we don't realize how deeply and thoroughly God loves us. And how that love should radically change our thoughts and actions if we really understand the depth and thoroughness and faithfulness of God's love for us, it will change us. Even in the book of Malachi, this Old Testament book of rebuke, 
God is showing his love to us. Let me read two passages in closing. In closing. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. To see part of God's love in forging us. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince and power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom you all once lived in the passions of your flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This was your state. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, that word there, great, mega, the mega love that God has for you, even when you were dead in your trespasses, you offered nothing. In fact, not only did you offer nothing, you offered against what was God's glory, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. This is what he's done for you. Do you think he's going to abandon you now? When we look to communion and the suffering of Christ on the cross and everything he gave, do you think he's going to abandon you now? No, beloved. If you need to wonder, where do I look to to see God's love? Look to the cross of Jesus Christ. Let that uh, still all your fears. Let that calm all your anxieties. Let that uh, satiate all your worries of God's love for <laughs> the cross of Jesus Christ shows it. Do you want to understand how much God loves you? Well, in closing, Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? This was the very cry of the Edomites are over there. Well, if God's for us, we're the majority. We win. Verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, notice the focus of where God's love is, the cross of Christ, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. You can't bring a charge against me. God's the one that justifies me. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. How can someone condemn me if Jesus is my intercessor? Verse 35 in Romans 8. So then, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? I guarantee that right now, intellectually you'd say nothing. But some of us in our heart, we feel that there are things that are separating us that aren't showing God's love in our life. We'll hear from the word of the Lord. Shall tribulation, if you're in tribulation, that shall that separate you from all Christ? Or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or a sword? He admits, for his written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. And all these things were more than conqueror through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, sometimes life can be scarier than death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present that we're going through, nor things to come that we might face, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Beloved, he is forging you. He is molding you. Whatever trial, tribulation, and crucible you're in, he is using that for your good and his glory. His love will never, ever depart from you. It started way back in election and eternity past. It continues on as he defends you today, and it will go on into the future when his glory covers the earth as the ocean covers the sea. At this time, Pastor Skip is going to lead us in reflection and invitation based on what we've heard.